So you have pictures here of your mother and your father. Um, Glenn is going to have close-ups of them, but do you think you could show us, um, for example, I know they're each wearing their uniform. Yeah, here is uh, my mother as a, as a Lotta. Uh, this was taken probably, I would say, in the maybe 39. And how old was she in 1939? 39, she would have been 20, Four. Mm -hmm. And um, my father here, he is a, you see that he only has one, one, I don't know how they are called. Button. Button. Something on it. Mm -hmm. And here he is already, he was, uh, he became a lieutenant. And then after the war, he was a captain. And so for how many years was your mother uh working in Lota and your father in the army? Um, I know that in, I, there's a big write-up here also when Yala, uh, her home village had started um, the Lota uh, movement, which was in the 20s. So um, I don't think that my mother got involved until the uh, uh, early on, before, before the war started in the late late 30s. And um, and for how long was she in the Lota? Through the end of all the wars? She was through the end of the war, to the end of the continuation war. Oh, and continuation mm -hmm. war. Mm -hmm. And your father? And my father was in the war after the, uh, after the war had ended in, uh, in, um, September of 44, mm -hmm. he was still, from the letters, I was able to, uh, that he was there still uh, several months afterwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in their first four years of marriage, they they were always apart. Mm -hmm. This Here is a, an, it says, Lotta Sverdin Kultaiset Sanat. It is like the... Um, the Lotus Bad, the Golden Words. And um, I can try to translate it. Um, the God, fear of God should be your uh, biggest strength. Learn to love your country and your nation. Set high your Lotta idols. Only the righteous, clean, and uh, sober, can you be a real Lotta? Uh, require always most from yourself. Be good. Be faithful in even the littlest things. And remember, in the hardships, you remember the hugeness of your goal. Respect and help your Lotta sisters in their work. That way your sense of unity will strengthen. Remember the past generation's uh, achievements. Respect the elderly, elderly. They have done more than we. Be humble in your outfit and in presenting yourself. Have a good self-discipline. That way you will raise the discipline of the whole organization. Lotta, remember to represent large uh, patriotic organization. Be careful not to do anything that will hurt it or its reputation. Those are very high ideals. Yes. <laughs> now my mother is writing to my father. This is um, during the continuation war. 
Siis se on se jännittävää tämä nykyinen aika. Tänään on kuukausi siitä, kun Saksa alkoi ja se on mennyt kuin viikko vain. Olen usein ajatellut, että on tosiaan suuremmoista saada elää tämän sukupolven aikana, joka lapsilleen voi jättää suuren ja vapaan Suomen. Sen rinnalla eivät muu, suuremmatkaan uhraukset pelota. She's saying it's very, exi- very exciting, or not exciting, but, but scary, this, this um, current state. It has been just a month when, uh, when Germany started the war and it uh, feels like a, one a week. Then she says that she has been thinking about a lot, that it is great to be of a generation uh, who can leave for their children great and free Finland. In the light of that, even the greatest sacrifices don't scare. So she's showing her... So this is the sentiments are always, you know, the great longing and hoping for the war to end and and um, and always being optimistic try to do and uh, and being optimistic and proud to do this sacrifice because of the the com- the goal which was to keep finland independent mm-hmm. So did your parents talk to you at all about their experiences, um, either during the evacuation or during the wars, um, or even when they were evacuated to Uriala area? Uh, not much. By my mom, she was the oldest in the family at the time, age nine. So she had to take the family's four cows and two horses to train and whatever big belongings they could fit into the wagon. Her dad had to be serving in the army, and a couple of younger kids, uh, her mom had to, to took them on a train ahead of time to the western get, get safety, and yeah. she, she and she had to take the uh, the cattle to uh, to a nearby railway station and uh, from there to the train. So I've seen pictures of this evacuation in that. They go along with the song Evakon Laulu, and it shows people leading their animals. And they, were they put on trains then and taken out of Karelia also? Yeah, they were like in cattle wagons. And actually the people were also, they were like two layers, two platforms to uh, sleep in. Mm-hmm. And one thing my mom said, it was real embarrassing. They had just a bucket in the middle of the wagon for everybody to go take a to do the business and mm-hmm. I had a really embarrassing moment. Mm-hmm. I know that your your mother was the old was one of the older children and she and her sister and then there were two younger ones. Were they also with them? The two youngest ones? During the continuation war, the two of her younger siblings were actually sent to Sweden. Uh, one was four years old, I think, and one was like two, something like that. And how long were they in Sweden? They were in Sweden like two or three years, three years, I think. And they went right into neighboring houses there. So they were some, some kind of for having some brother close by. Mm-hmm. And did they learn to speak Swedish? Actually, the younger one could not even speak Finnish when they came back. He could only speak Swedish, but the old one obviously already knew Finnish before they left. Mm-hmm. And was that very common that many children were sent to Sweden for safety? Yeah, they sent quite a few uh, children at the, during the continuation war. But why, when they went to that uh, southwestern Finland area, did they start farming again? Did the government give them land? Yes, uh, there was one 
big farm. I don't know how big it was, but they all these evacuees, they got like maybe 20, 25 acre plots, but it was mainly swamp land. So it was not very arable. They had, they, they, like, my, yeah, my mom's parents and my dad's parents, they, they were my, mile apart, their farms. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, they, they dug these big pits mm-hmm. out of the field. And uh, they tried to get some clay and mix that with the uh, swamp plant, try to make it a little more arable, but they were catching tree roots and stuff like that every time when they plowed the fields. It was really uh, hard farming over there. And uh, did they know the other, did they know other people from other Karelian uh, evacuees in the area or just your parents knew each other? I used, yeah, they, they did know several others, and there was actually another couple that was between my mom's parents and my dad's side, and there was another couple that came from the same area and between us. So they, they knew quite a few each other. Mm-hmm. And did those uh, farmers help each other? Yes, they did. They, uh, they, they built the houses. They got together as a big group. They built one house after another. So how long did your family stay at that farm and uh, what did they do after they had completed that farm? In Urjala? Mm-hmm. Uh, they stayed there until 1960 and uh, they wanted to move way, way from there because they always felt like they are evacuees. They were always viewed as evacuees and uh, they got land from somebody else's farm uh, that's i think that's the biggest reason they wanted to move out of that area but but also the land was very poor mm-hmm. farming so where did they go next they moved to uh Iti, and that's more towards the east like 100 miles east uh with, with, between kovola and lahti that area okay, okay now um do you feel like your um parents experiences during the wars and the evacuation um, affected you? Did it change, did it impact how you were raised? I would think it impacted me very much because uh, in my young life, we did not have anything. My parents, they lost everything during the war, other than the, a couple of cows and horses, but they lost everything else, the houses, farms, and that uh, they were always rural frugal. If, even if they had money, they did not. They everything went to the farm machinery and in, improving the farm, tiling the fields, things like that. So I've been always real frugal myself. And uh, did you have? A, did your family have a car, or how did you get around? Well, to to go anywhere, either we walked, rode bicycles, or skied. And we didn't get our first car until like 1965. Mm-hmm. And if we fancier things like the sewing club that we attended one was the once a month I think it was it was about from every house took turns when they host that the coffee and uh, coffee bread stuff like that so we took the tractor dad drives the tractor and we ended the trailer behind mm-hmm. what was the sewing club it was that the, uh, a group of neighbors get together women on one side uh, I don't know if they were, it, it's called a sewing club, but mm-hmm. I don't know if they, I, I guess they did do knitting socks, uh, mitten sweater, stuff like that. And the men were on the other side of the house talking politics, stuff like that. And they did, I guess they mentioned once in a while the war too, but very, very seldom. And where did the children go? The women's side, the men's side, could they go anywhere they wanted or did you play outside? The kids were just usually outside if the weather was good enough. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And have you uh, shared any of this information with your own family, with your children, and uh, told them about the experiences of your family? Not much at all, because I did not know anything that, about that myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, two years ago, my wife and our daughter, the older daughter, and her child, we, we thought my mom was already in bad shape, so they went to Finland. Uh, just to, for my mom to see them at least once, uh, our granddaughter. And uh, then my mom actually told about these details. I never knew that my dad had served and the uh, scars in his knees were from Sharpnell. I never knew that until two years ago. Mm-hmm. So I, 
lately I've been telling them more when, since I found out things. Yes. And as a result of preparing to share your story, has that uh, impacted you in, in any way? Yeah, I'm I'm a lot more interested in really and I, I realized how little I know about my person experiences mm-hmm. and I began the pe- people just did not talk about anything about the war back then and uh, like my mo- my mo- <clears throat> mom finally opened up to my wife mm-hmm. about this stuff when they were just together. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if there are women more comfortable talking about this stuff or what it is or if my mom knew that she's dying and she wanted to share her information. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's go back to at the time the Winter War began and you had mentioned and you have a picture of his Glider's glider pilot's license. How did how did he happen to have this interest in aviation, and how did he where did he do this gliding training? Was it in Finland? Yes, it was in Finland, and and you know I think it was uh, just a you know attraction that a boy has for aviation, and he uh, took took it upon himself to go to glider pilot school, and he did all the groundwork that he needed to do, and. Uh, he, he was, he was planning a career in aviation and, and so getting the, his glider pilot license was like the first step becoming an aviator. And he worked on building them and he worked on, uh, he did the ground school and he did the flight training and then the winter war started and he, while he was ineligible, to serve in a full military capacity, there was a, uh, a a paramilitary structure where boys could boys of that age could participate, and they served as watchdogs along the along the uh, r- more rural areas and watching bridges and watching fields for encroachment of Russians, and it would help move supplies and do things like that. So it wasn't they weren't uh, formally formal military participants, but they played an active role. And then when the continuation war started, he was, he was eligible and uh, he was, uh, you know, joined the formal. What, what year did each of your parents pass? Mom uh, passed in, on Thanksgiving Day, uh, November 28th, 2002. And dad, um, graduated to heaven on June 28th, 2015. So he had, was that his, uh, was that a suggestion from you to him that the articles, the artifacts be kept as a collection? Um, and then he liked that idea because of the educational value? Yes, that it would yes. I, I didn't think it would was appropriate to not get his blessing for that. I mean, it's something that we could have done after his passing, but um, I thought it was would be more personally significant to him, and it would be uh, it would be better for us to, to re, you know have his blessing to do that and, and, and gift gift the gift those things away, and we did that. And the chain of events from that conversation with Dad about what to do with this large catalog of of primary source artifacts. I mean, it was just really something, as you said, it's it's multiple pages, and that it was such a beautiful fit for the museum because they had a gap in historic content of that nature. So it sort of filled this void for them. But the wonderful catalyst for that conversation and the donation and fitting the bill for them then fostered this conversation that Dave Mackey wanted and enabled Helen to sit down with dad who had sustained a stroke and the conversation was halting and uh, slow. 
but she was able to extrapolate from him these details about the war that had remained locked in him for so many years, decades. And it sort of gave him the opportunity, the purpose, the permission to unpack both the burden of the war and the transformative process that occurred in him because of it. And so we are grateful because now we know the story. Now, when you were growing up, did your father talk at all about his experiences in the war and either the winter war or the continuation war? Because you had some, one of you had mentioned that uh, he would get to a point where he would say, well, that's enough for now. I was, I was always interested in history and, and later became a history teacher. And so I was interested in digging out the details of any story. And I would ask question after question after question. And I would start to go down that road about wartime with dad. And I was so curious. And he would unpack a little bit of it in generalities. And I would prod for more. And he would say, well, that's enough about that. And I knew the subject was closed. And so really, we came to his age of 91 when he divulged details. That's a long wait. And that's a long time to hold it. And what do you think the effect was on him uh, to be in that spa program with the other veterans because it seems like you you saw a change in his ability to speak about that after those spa event events. Um, in his 80s, I thought it was marvelous that he was traveling solo to Finland in his 80s. Just right there, that's a man of courage. And he was invited to spa events for veterans, uh, a week-long stay. And, and when he would come back, he would share with me about uh, the hot tub and the lap swim and the gym and the personal trainers and the wonderful meals and the camaraderie. He never once mentioned that there was any kind of group therapy session, uh, any kind of psychological support, any kind of counseling that occurred. But I think the combination of creating an atmosphere in which it was all right to release these memories into a safe and understanding environment changed him. And as he came back, he became more at ease uh, with the unfolding of that part of his life and that story. And when you think about the formation of a 17-year-old to a 24-year-old, in that kind of atmosphere, it's, it's very, very significant. And so we, we are thankful for that opportunity for him, for a healing event. To the segment of the program to the Winter War, former ski trooper and Winter War veteran, El Lehikoinen will discuss three weapons which worked well in the Winter War and the War Continuation. Thank you. My talk today could be probably titled as The Tales of a Gun. And uh, we're going to be talking about a military rifle that has an exceptionally long uh, lifetime. It has been in operation for about 80 years and done very well. This tale uh, starts with uh, going back all the way to Peter the First, or Peter the Great, who uh, was the first the Tsar of Russia and later the Emperor from uh, 1682 to 1725, and in his pursuit of westernizing Russia, he also looked at the uh, arms that the Russians were using at the time and uh, decided to uh, build a uh, small arms factory in Tula, Russia, which is in central Russia, about a, a hundred miles south of Moscow. And he wanted to keep up the small arms 
uh, development and manufacturing keep up in the Western world. In the early 1880s, Russia wanted to replace her antiquated Russian uh, Berlin's right military rifle with a better one. So there was a contest held in which many different designs were submitted. And two designs that came through were one by a French design by, uh, and one by a Russian. And uh, they couldn't decide on first place and they looked at the, the characteristics of these two guns and decided there were some good characteristics in both. So they combined uh, some of these together and so the Russian rifle called M91 was developed and uh, it came under the name of Mosin Nagant Military Rifle M91. So you were, you told me you were, I think, 15 when the Winter War started, and you were, uh, can you tell us how you knew that war had started that day on November 30th of 1939? Well, I was in school, and it was a nice afternoon, and the principal walks in, and she says that Finland and Russia are um, having a war. Please go home. But now my house was already, I was only three blocks from the school. It didn't help me. But my some of my roommates were scared because they had to take a train or bus to go home. And they didn't know if it's going to run. But they arranged, the city arranged so that the kids got home. Mm -hmm. And didn't your father say that they could stay with you if they couldn't? Yeah. But, uh, of course, uh, we were only 13 or so. So the kids were a little, little childish, so we wanted to go home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. So was your town, was Vamala ever bombed during, the, during these wars? No, it happened so that in the war, eastern part of Finland, there was another community that was called Vamala. Oh. And uh, they were bombed first. Then they realized that's the wrong city. <gasps> now, our Vamala had the uh, factory where they made bombs, but they never came there. Mm-hmm. Now, Vamala was close to Tom, is close to Tampere. And I, well, Tampere was a bigger city. Was that they bombed? Were trying, they were trying to bomb the bigger cities. Turku and Tampere and Vasa and Helsinki mm -hmm. and those. You know, did you, did you, could you hear these planes going overhead? Yes. And they were flying very low. So they were really loud. Your home almost shook when they were going by. Oh. I think it may be saved fume, I mean gasoline or something, when they didn't go height. Mm -hmm. Was everyone afraid when these planes of went course. over? Of course. We were just scared to death. And the, uh, we had to have tar paper on the, at night time on the windows and try to only use one room. So, you know, so you didn't have to buy that much tar paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to walk in the dark outside. Mm -hmm. what, were there broadcasts every day about what was happening? Yes, maybe one hour. Mm -hmm. and that's all Daddy let us use the radio. And then they, we find out that there's no children's programs anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, um, during the the Continuation War, uh, you were in. What did what happened to the kids during the summer when school was out? What did you do during the Continuation well, if War? If you were thirteen or older, 
you had to go and work with a farmer. I, you learned how to milk a cow <laughs> and weed and cook and bake. And both um, the summers I worked, the uh, host of the big farms chose me to be in the kitchen with them. Mm -hmm. Because then she used to have a lot of people and uh, uh, we, you know, that uh, it was time to f pick the crop. Mm -hmm. And the city chair workers who worked at factories had to go and work at the farms. Mm -hmm. So they came over, and I usually was always was the cook's helper, the farmer wife's helper. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but go good cook then already. <laughs> so did you stay at the farmhouse or did you come yes, every day? I stayed at the farmhouse. Because it was quite a distance to, to go. Mm -hmm. Maybe three miles. Could you could you have stayed in Finland and worked? I feel it was American City Census. Mm -hmm. You're American sure. citizen. And I was out of school, so I just came back and I thought I can get a better job here. Mm -hmm. A better job? Mm -hmm. As American citizen, could you have worked in Finland? No. Oh. You uh, Finland uh, only has uh, local workers and there's no green card mm -hmm. like we have here. So I was adult and I, that's why I came here. Mm -hmm. uh that's the only thing I think to me. And then every week there was bodies coming in for the funerals in your community. And mm -hmm. it was so sad. So there were no boys in your class because they all went off? Did the tar paper stick on the windows? No. Or did you have to cover the like sides? Cup, like you have your... Uh, you know, that towel over the window. There's a bar and my father made some kind of... So you roll it down mm -hmm. and push it up. But did you have to Did you have to block the sides of it so the light wouldn't go out the sides? Or was it close oh, enough? Oh yeah, you have to make sure it was against the wall. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or then that much wider than the window. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. And then, okay. Mom, you told me that one time you forgot to put the tar paper down, and the soldiers, Finnish soldiers, came over, knocked on the door, and really it, scolded. It wasn't the so soldier, it was the uh, ser sheriff. Scolded oh. you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, oh, they, they thought father was doing some. Oh, they thought it was on purpose. Trying to give signals. Mm. Yeah, they really blamed dad that he was trying to give signals that there's a town here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow, that's scary. But it was funny, the light was going on day after mm -hmm. day though. And I remember that night, we were still at the old place the day before we moved, and we heard that in the dark of the night, we heard the soldiers walking towards the station mm -hmm. to be leave, you know, the community men. Mm -hmm. To leave. To leave, yeah. And you hear them with their boots there. Mm -hmm. Now they took. Now my father had to be. Um, they made one of these watchtowers, and my mm -hmm. father had to take his turn to watch. Uh -huh. All the elderly, a little bit older. I think your like father was some kind of an official. That's why you got a telephone. Well, that was another time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he worked for the city that time. That was later. Um, but anyway, that was no fun, no fun. Mm -hmm. You told me before about the gift of a box of raisins was one of the oh, yeah. most memorable no, well, Christmas That presents. was before the war. That was 1933. Oh, mm -hmm. See, when we war, lived huh? in this country, mm -hmm. my father had a job outside. He was a um, carpenter mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. in Long Island at the time. And then we lived in a small apartment building, and mother and father were their janitor, should I say. Mm -hmm. 
So father would stoke the big uh, winter time, the big um, stove, corn, wherever you put the coal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and mother would wash the stairways and and mother often would help to rent the place. Usually the owner came there if she had a vacancy. Mm -hmm. But anyway, these people always, they gave us a lot of gifts. Mm -hmm. oh. Or if they had something they would throw away, they would ask mother if she wants it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I would love to get their old purses. Oh, that mm -hmm. was seven and then they'd have a purse with an empty lipstick tube there. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't... Being a big, I mean, I was little, but I felt that it was a big girl. Everything, everything we had, we lost. We lost our house, trucks, everything we lost. The Nancy, you had told us about this song, Eva con Laulu, which is the song of the evacuees. Yes. I think there's a picture in there that that uh, shows a typical scene from yes. evacuation. And so this actually, this is like your almost like your family because yeah, it, it could, could be. be it could be your grandma yeah. and well, you and and your brother and yeah. your parents, but yeah, your my father. Parents, my dad wasn't there. Yes, he was. He was in the he army. Was, he was already fighting. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So that was just my mom and grandma and us two boys. So mm -hmm. that's where they came to Vasa, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, my mother and uh, my brother and myself. We were standing on the on the sidewalk watching the the German German troops marching into Finland. And were they on? Where were they going? I know that they ended up in Lapland, but yeah, at, when but they the, first came, I, I really don't know. But that's where they landed. That's that's where they made they made their uh, appearance in mm -hmm. Finland. That's mm -hmm. where the boats landed, and that's where they came in the land. Do you? Do you know you were so young at the time, but maybe you learned later? How did people feel about having the German troops come into Finland? Well, I think there were mixed mixed feelings because there are some people who want because they came they are supposedly helping Finland, mm -hmm. and uh, if, there are a lot of people who didn't think that they helped at all. But then there were some people who think that they did. But then, of course, in the end of the end of the war, we ended up chasing them away from Lapland too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it uh, it was. Now, uh, the town where your father was living, you mentioned that there were uh, communists there. Were they evacuees also? No, no, they were local ones. That, that of course, uh, most of the people. Uh, over there, didn't care for the Karelians anyway to coming and uh, barging in on, into their lives. And uh, so, uh, of course, and, and there was one settlement in this Oravine, and I, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was far in the woods they occupied this lumber camp. Because I remember a lot of these Karelian kids come with a horse and a sled and and horse and carriage to school mm -hmm. in Dwarawan. Mm -hmm. But uh, but they were everybody kinda of looked down their nose at them. But uh, but we were we were part of the part of them except we didn't live in the woods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know it was the Finnish government's decision to place the refugees around the country in different yeah, well, places. The the people who didn't have any destination actually, like we did, mm -hmm. because uh, my dad had already told my mother that if, when we had to leave, that uh, her sister was going to take us in for the mm -hmm. winter. And uh, but there were 
people who ended up at these uh, town halls and the uh, farmers from around there, they were making bets according to the size of the families and stuff, who wanted them. So they were settled in different farms. And that's how they were, and they used them uh, as farmhands too. That's, was, that's in the song too. Yeah, nice. so they used them as, as uh, farmhands. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did any of those people uh, stay in that area or uh, were they able to get their own farms or were they? Well, I think most of them uh, got their own places as soon as they could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't think anybody, any Finn would want to sleep in somebody else's quarters unless they had to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you mentioned that in the town there were uh, people who, because you your family wasn't part of the Communist Party, they uh, were pretty much opposed to you and, and showed it by that Yes. Poster. Yes, because every I think everybody knew that we were not communists. We were chased away from our home by the communists. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the funny feeling was that they labeled us fascist for some reason, and we had no. My parents never had a, any inclination of uh, showing any fascism or anything in there. Or mine or anything that because they were I always remember my dad as a Democrat mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, uh, in fact social Democrat but uh, <clears throat> but I don't know how they got that but they uh, they labeled us as such and what was the poster like the uh, they put a poster on our door one time. It had a. It was a. It must have been election time or something because there were political posters, and there was a, a, a German uh, swastika on this poster, and a fist that was crushing that mm -hmm. poster, and uh, <clears throat> it it said in it was a Swedish poster. It says Christopher system, which means uh, crush fascism, and uh, then uh, they had put a piece of paper on there where they had a hanging tree with four people on there, mom and dad, and two younger ones, hanging from the end of the rope, and they said, and the Nurmis are the first. It used to buy a flower, and, and so she bought things like coffee and sugar, uh, probably candy for the kids, I'm mm -hmm. guessing, and probably mittens, socks. I'm sure she sent socks that they would knit and send those things over for mm -hmm. them. So she, she tried to do her part over here as much as she could because she had all her family there. She was the mm -hmm. only one from her family in this country. Oh, so um, what, what would you say were the effects of your experiences during those war years on you as you were growing up and as, as an adult? I, I really tell you that uh, it, I think it made me a better person because we learned a lot. We learned to do things with our hands and uh, we knew how to tolerate other people because we were mixed up with different kinds of people. So mm -hmm. we were... Uh, tolerant of anything mm -hmm. that came around. Your parents, when the first of the wars began, Winter War, my father was 37 and my mother was 34 and were, you know, you said you were living in um, Karelia and will you tell us about what happened to your family because of this first of the wars starting? I think um, because they were so close to the Russian border, like 
really close. Um, the, I know my mother had to be evacuated once, just very quickly because the war front was approaching, but um, she could return. And the second time was more serious. They already knew that their land and their house and everything was going to be left on the Russian side. So then they evacuated permanently with whatever belongings they could get. And my father was in a war already, even, yeah, the whole, both evacuations, he was in service of the war. So your mother, so when you had this land um, closer to Helsinki in Rajamäki, mm -hmm. uh, were there other um, evacuated Karelian families in the yes. area? I think government had negotiated the parcel of uh, uh, of these farms or farmlands from the owner that had a lot of land and uh, maybe not always uh, very good feelings that the government would sort of force part like we do here for the build a highway or mm -hmm. whatever. So, but it wasn't that, but we surely knew that it wasn't a welcome thing mm -hmm. to, to give away what they had. There was 10% of Finnish population was evacuated, so it was not a small amount. It was like uh, 430,000 from 4 million people. So, so it was tough so, on both. So the government had made plans for, from, for everybody of where they would go, or could people choose to go where they wanted to go? They could choose to go if they if they had relatives or people that they could support them. Mm -hmm. But when government supported whatever they were able to, like this land, they were directed because they didn't want one community have too many because that time Finland didn't have a lot, so they could not support that. So mm -hmm. every region in Karelia was giving a region where they were directed to go. Surely, every, some people found a different way of surviving, but many people followed that governmental plan. Was the plan for, did they try to keep people close to each other, neighbors close to each other in the new land, or? Yes, I think it was, I don't know, was it how close neighbors they were? Mm -hmm. But when I look at the Karelian map now, and I see the names as a child, I heard every name, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they were, they were, but people knew where their relatives were if mm -hmm. they were not in the same uh, location. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it's just, I think government was very wise to, to do that because it was easier for the nation to become together and, uh, and um, really I wouldn't say that they would be eager and welcome of these refugees, but they were helpful and they they trusted their government had done the right thing. So all in all, I think it was a surprising, uh, well-directed evacuation. And and did those families get together with each other? Yes, and that is something that I actually very much would like one day to be able to kind of communicate in a, in a more uh, efficient way. Karelians uh, are very social, and uh, they're very, they're different than Western Finns. If you're a stranger, they talk to you. Usually, uh, Western Finns don't talk to strangers. And they touch easily and they tell their story and uh, and uh, that what happened in that my Karelian community every other week they got together and they they named it uh, like storytelling in Finland is tari, tarinoita but Karelian said it turinoita <laughs> so there was this language that uh, kind of a difference mm -hmm. so they had that like a storytelling evening, and they served coffee, 
and, and Bulla and other stuff. And they told their stories about evacuation. And they, sometimes they were crying, they were laughing, but they were like one big family. And that was extremely comforting. And when everything outside was so unsafe, you know, Rajamäki was bombed on a Jatkosota uh, because there was a railway and there was a distillery of alcohol there, big, you know. So it was so comforting and they were singing. They loved singing. And uh, I thought that that would be some lesson for people to learn <laughs> that you have to get together and you have to share and you have to find something that helps you tolerate the chaos and, mm -hmm. and the stress of that. I still think that uh, human beings, when they share, and if they are good people mostly, they share an experience like that. It does pull them together. They find ways of sharing their food. They, they cooperate, they buy equipment together. When they harvest, the whole village will go and harvest every land. But there is side to it that is so encouraging that human beings can do that in, in the middle of this, what to me was big chaos, but I was little and they were big. So um, there is, I think, a lot of lessons to be learned that what we human beings can do. And I always think that if you, you have to have a government that, that gives you basic service, services like, like health and you have to have hospitals and doctors and, and where to buy food and that stuff. But beyond that, If you have that kind of sharing cooperative uh, attitude and uh, you help each other, you have a teacher or a mentor for somebody that doesn't know something and uh, do that, I think human beings can overcome almost anything. If you are healthy and willing to work, if you are not healthy, you, you won't have a good life under those circumstances. And, uh, um, and if you don't want to put on effort, you can overcome. You have to have, you have to have willingness to put effort into it. I think it's a beautiful story of uh, human nature and uh, what human beings can do. And um, I think there would be maybe a lot of lessons to learn even in today's world with the huge immigration problems that um, I, I, I haven't said that before this way, but, and I can kind of value that. And I was born 1940 and I went through all that, but I do value the understanding and, and um, what human beings can be and also what they maybe should be.